Hello and welcome to this session of Inclusive Futures workshop exhibition series. Uh, today we will have presenters from generally the North American region, um, some on the East Coast, some on the West Coast, but mostly the Eastern um, Coast workshops. Uh, and today we have presenting uh, Mona Gandhi uh, with her workshop, Kinetoscapes, uh, Shermin Youssef presenting for uh, Creative AI Ecologies, uh, and Manos will be joining us for the discussion as well at the end for that workshop. Uh, Neri Odur for Digital Unforgetting, and Tom Verbes and Pablo Lorenzo Eroa for data, Design Data, and Gustavo Rincon will be presenting his workshop, Conversations on Inclusivity. Uh, so these workshops were a range of topics, but largely um, one of the themes that I see occurring here in North America is AI um, and design as well as interactive design. And also the last two uh, presentations deal directly with inclusivity, um, which is gonna be very interesting as this is a very current topic um, in the States these days. So please let's welcome our presenters um, to this session. Our first presenter will be Shermin Youssef, who will be presenting um, for the Creative AI Ecologies, which was taught between uh, Shermin uh, Manos Vermosa and uh, Daniel Balajan, who couldn't be here today, but please welcome Shermin. Thank you, Virginia, um, for having me. And uh, I'm going to share my screen to start. You can see it perfectly. I yes, guess. Good. Perfect. Thank you so much, Virginia. Um, so, uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this session. Um, it's my honor to present on behalf of my. Um, uh, colleagues, uh, the three of us, Professor Daniel Bolajan and Professor Emmanuel Vermisso, who's here with us for the dis discussion today, and myself. We are all a professor, uh, uh, me and Daniel are assistant professors, and uh, Professor Vermisso is associate professor at Florida Atlantic University. Um, the presentation um, is on, uh, is showcasing our workshop, uh, Creative AI Ecologies. And um, in terms of, um, yeah, this is the three of us. Um, Daniel couldn't make it uh, to be with us today, uh, but uh, we have all his ideas and thoughts in the presentation. <laughs> and uh, as an agenda, we are actually um, trying to, um, I'm, I'm trying to discuss uh, the logic and uh, the rationale and the approach for our workshop first, and offer a retrospect on what we did last year versus what we did this year, 2021. Um, and um, offer an outline to our uh, workshop agenda in terms of our approach to human machine interaction, our uh, multi designer bi directional strategy that I will explain, and then creativity and AI and uh, creative process versus creative product. Um, the workshop results, of course, would be showcased um, in the second um, part of the presentation in terms of what uh, the groups did, uh, in terms of their design workflows and uh, their results. So starting uh, with what we did um, last year, uh, this is a simple uh, video, a short video uh, that shows that. And um, in my understanding is that why did we did this workshop is that we are trying to um, um, propose different workflows. So in this light of observed AI and integration of AI into architecture design, our workshop proposes a reconsideration of this architecture design cycle in terms of using nested uh, AI models, uh, what we call chained AI models. So rather than uh, 
uh, treating AI as a closed cycle of input output, a series of complementary deep neural networks proposed uh, propose here in a logical continuity in what we call AI driven workflows. Uh, we are challenging and augmenting designers agency and we'll talk about agency later in the presentation. So our new framework encourages this machine assisted uh, creativity for tackling various architectural and urban uh, systems. Um, and uh, from last year, we see these results. Um, we, we wanted to use multiple AI models to tackle multiple uh, architecture and urban systems in terms of um, uh, tasks and faces uh, in the design process. Um, structural logic, um, formal articulation, enclosure responsiveness, and etc. cetera. Um, moving to um, this topic of uh, human uh, machine interaction, uh, we actually have this uh, simple diagram that shows these uh, multiple modes of interaction that uh, we deal with in our design workflows and in, in the workshop agenda. And we know that there is always this designer designer. So uh, the design process is not necessarily uh, done by one designer, but, but more of a team, right? And then there is the designer AI interaction and then the AI AI interaction, which we focus on in explaining our workflows. So the process is actually um, more complex. So instead of the left side um, uh, part of the diagram where we have one designer controlling um, AI models in what we call one designer unidirectional um, strategy, we actually, in our workflow, we have the right side part. We have um, a more complex process where we have multiple designers um, human agents and multiple AI models, and it's a bi-directional strategy, so it's more complex. So the, our work um, is part of a research project. So this workflow um, and this overall uh, uh, workshop is actually part, part of our research project that we want to examine this human AI collaborative structure and how to combine machine and designer creativity in a comprehensive interactive process to develop what we uh, call a sensibility for an optimal collaboration where designers expertise combined with the machine caliber. Um, um, the objective, of course, is to uh, hopefully um, uh, propose uh, a workflow that supports and enhances creativity. And uh, of course, creativity is a huge topic, um, but for us um, to um, tackle AI creativity um, is something that we investigated. So uh, I know that experts identify novelty and um, utility among uh, manifestations of the creative process. And uh, according to Margaret Bowden, the famous uh, professor who uh, researches um, cognitive science and creativity is that creativity is the ability to come up with ideas or artifacts that are new, surprising and valuable. Now, um, also uh, a general uh, definition is that is to uh, creativity can be defined as an idea or product that is original, right? And valued and implemented. In terms of AI and creativity, according to Demis Hassabis, the AI researcher and the CEO of DeepMind, uh, there are three types of creativity um, that AI um, is capable of performing maybe two of them, uh, interpolation and extrapolation, uh, while AI is not capable yet of performing any uh, invention, right? So interpolation in this case is um, uh, the, uh, the AI's capability to um, perform the averaging of the uh, representation of the data, averaging of the training examples, right? It's still contained within the field, while extrapolation is a higher level creativity because there is this extension of the boundaries of that field. Uh, which happens. Uh, we believe that certain AI models like, like StyleGAN, although it's very interesting and fascinating, it's still within the interpolative um, uh, domain or aspect, while CycleGAN is actually uh, capable of, of performing extrapolation. Um, so this uh, approach to creativity is not just within one AI model, is within the overall process and within the overall structure. So. Um, uh, this is uh, our proposed workflow that we offer to our workshop participants. Uh, so we targeted three um, layers, we call them layers, uh, which are 
design phases and design tasks in terms of organization and environmental analysis in, in, incorporated and then the approach to three-dimensional aspect and massing. Uh, so we expand this flexibility of AI assisted design by proposing this series of complementary deep neural networks, establishing this logical continuity in the design decisions um, now, um, through this combination of multiple AI models and parametric uh, uh, and generative uh, systems and also simulation approaches um, and using AI's capability of representation learning and domain transfer, we have these parallel iterative workflows to address the design. Um, in this year's workshop, we focus on urban scale. Um, now, the instructors intended this uh, workflow, um, and we followed these, what we call two tracks. So we have six groups um, uh, divided into um, two uh, parallel tracks. Uh, so each two groups, like group one and four, will uh, tackle the same aspect, organizational aspect. Yet, we were surprised uh, by the end of the workshop that each a group actually uh, went uh, with experimentation beyond what we expected. So they had parallel workflows and we will uh, show them one by one. So uh, the overall workflow is really, really complex because um, the intended uh, objective is that the output of group one, for example, becomes the input of group two as a continuation of uh, from organizational to environmental layer and from environmental to uh, massing layer and so on. Um, so this succeeded perfectly, um, but the surprising part is that e each group went much more complex than one workflow or a few AI models. Um, this is one example where we have actually um, group one in the organizational layer and you can see that they have a one workflow with two cycle GAN, um, one uh, style GAN model and then another workflow with two style GAN models and then a third workflow with uh, one cycle GAN and uh, three style GAN models and so on and then MIDAS which is um, a very interesting pre-trained model that actually tackles uh, this depth map and um, performs it uh, quickly uh, in a timely manner. So this is a, a group work, um, the group where Carlos, Christine, and um, Iri. Um, this is one of the results. As you can see here, um, this is one workflow where they have one style GAN to tackle sand dunes, uh, generating fake sand dunes, and then another style, style GAN generating um, fake urban uh, uh, morphologies, and then a third style GAN that combines both. So it breeds uh, the sand dunes with the urban uh, morphology and so on. So we have this um, output of the two style GANs uh, to, to become the input of the third one. As you can see in the interpolation uh, walks, the videos here. Um, another group, which is also within the organizational layer, took three different workflows. So um, this is a similar layer organization, but they actually ta tackled um, uh, the process differently. And in each workflow, they, they had uh, style GAN and cycle GAN. Um, we, in our logic, we um, used uh, style GAN models to create the uh, custom uh, data set and to generate the data set that is more controlled by designers so that it becomes the input of a cycle again. And we believe this enhances this uh, agency aspect and how designers can control this process. So um, yeah, we see here the three workflows and now we will see uh, their output. So uh, the left side is a style GAN um, a slime mold simulation that uh, has became a data set into uh, the style GAN model and then um, the style GAN breeded uh, and actually interpolated and created this fake uh, mold simulation. Um, now on the right side, um, it's the cycle GAN model and the cycle GAN used the input from the style GAN um, and combined with another domain, which is an urban domain. And you can see the fake uh, images are more um, new urban um, uh, formations or urban uh, design uh, and morphology that is informed and controlled by uh, the structure and semantics um, of, of the slime mold simulation. Um, that's one example. 
in another example, uh, you can see that um, we have um, a, a style GAN model on the left side that is uh, creating fake Mars uh, rock formations. And then on the right side, we see this um, uh, interpolation between um, a reaction diffusion um, uh, data set and also the uh, the Mars uh, formation and uh, this interpolation is like based on breeding these two or using the two uh, different uh, data sets into the style GAN. Um, this is a, another uh, continuation of the same group where actually they had um, now combined the Mars formation with the, um, with the fake urban settlements. And in this case, there is this interpolation uh, between um, these two uh, different uh, data sets. Um, in terms of environmental layer, so what we wanted to do is actually to tackle this uh, aspect of how do we qualify AI generated data and how do we move forward um, with uh, what to choose. Now we know that in StyleGAN, for example, there is this huge latent uh, space, right? And then to, um, to, to choose or to, to do sampling and selection, uh, there is a more rigorous process that this group has tackled, which is uh, to use uh, cycle GAN and then another picks to picks and then another style GAN so that they actually follow this logical um, uh, qualification or qualifying process. Uh, so we see that they also followed an overlap with the previous group with in terms of organization. Um, and then the logic was that they still use organization um, as part of the process, and then they test their uh, trained model with the output from the previous group. Right? And then we see here these uh, fake uh, urban um, design uh, images based on a breeding uh, domain uh, A and domain B, which are natural and urban systems. Um, the same uh, group now uh, used the cycle GAN output to, into a style GAN model. And you see here these multiple images moving with the style GAN that creates a more fake urban uh, design. Um, they also followed this environmental analysis of certain um, urban, um, cre created urban uh, structures um, that are based on from the um, style GAN model. So the style GAN model now became the input to a pix to pix testing. And that testing um, was to actually um, to, to um, evaluate the performance of the pix to pix which I think was successful in the, in the, in the case. And then the, the logic was to continue with the evaluation uh, so that we qualify certain uh, seeds in the style GAN model to um, inform certain three-dimensional approach. Um, this was just purely experimental. They didn't uh, follow this rigorously, but the other group was um, actually uh, doing that. So um, another approach to environmental analysis is not to use solar radiation, but actually to use certain uh, to topography and um, information from uh, the topology of, of certain uh, sites. And they use pix to pix and MIDAS in addition to the pix to pix uh, testing. So in terms of um, how to move from curves to uh, curves and surfaces to curves and terraces, uh, they had this parametric approach, the generative system to create these three-dimensional uh, models. And then they actually perform the pix to pix as you can see in the videos, uh, to um, have the supervised learning where a depth map would lead to the terracing automatically. And you can see the resulted terracing on the right side uh, animated um, image. Now, um, the same group actually followed a more rigorous approach so that they they had the data or they retrieved the data from the previous group to inform the pix to pix testing so that the, the pix to pix prediction was actually really successful. As you can see in the animation on the right side, uh, the fake versus the real is really kind of uh, similar. Uh, there is similarity in between. Um, the third layer was to actually move to a three-dimensional approach, so massing. And in this case, you can see this group went with um, multiple style GANs and one pix to, to pix, and then on the uh, lower side of the workflow is also another style GAN. And then they actually added more like post-processing approaches in terms of sampling and then methods to three-dimensional um, 
uh, approach and then style transfer in addition. Um, you can see their um, style GAN mountains breeding and then style GAN um, breeding mountains and urban um, structures. And you can see certain um, interpolation videos as um, the three of them should be moving. Yes, I think. Um, and these are representations of how to control um, urban design uh, process with certain uh, structural uh, and compositional aspects that designers are actually controlling. Um, moving to the what we did, the style transfer, I'm not a big fan of style transfer, but I think it was really successful here in terms of um, uh, using certain uh, aesthetics from abstract art to inform the composition or the uh, structural aspect of these urban uh, or fake urban images. And then they used a depth map to inform um, certain uh, three dimensional aspects. And this is the 3D attempt. Uh, the sampling and interpolation. The last two group in this case, uh, we're also tackling this massing and three-dimensional approach with a, a different approach uh, in terms of starting with MIDAS, uh, the network that actually uh, predicts this de depth map, um, and then another MIDAS and then style again, and then the 3D sampling. Uh, we'll see their results. So this is uh, the results where they actually had this urban uh, images and their depth map and, um, uh, and other natural patterns and also their depth maps. And then um, these depth maps were used for a uh, style GAN and then the style GAN results were informing uh, three-dimensional attempts. Um, in the end, this is our Miro board. It's a huge <laughs> uh, board with uh, more a messy uh, structure, but uh, I think uh, there is a more kind of unpredicted process that we were aiming for. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shermin. Uh, amazing as always. I, I think, um, Daniel and you and Manos had uh, taught a workshop last year as well, and it, the results have always been one of the uh, most popular workshops and also just amazing results from the students because you really um, have quite an intense workshop. I think it was, was it all um, seven days long, correct? We had the yeah. longest workshop, exactly. Yeah. Seven days, so, uh, eight hours, uh, almost seven to eight hours a day, yes. <laughs> yeah, so very intensive and it, the work really shows from that of like how much uh, you really learn from it. So amazing job. Um, so next we will have uh, Tom Verbes and Pablo Lorenzo Ero. Uh, who will be presenting uh, their workshop, Design Data. Um, please, go ahead. Uh, I don't know which one of you is going to present first, since you're both here. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, All right. There we go. Um, firstly, thank you to Virginia, Gustavo, both of you are here, and the rest of your Digital Futures team for uh, inviting us to participate in this really unprecedented, incredible event. Uh, it's also a great act to follow uh, what great work, Charmaine. Um, uh, really, on behalf of uh, my colleagues at NYIT and our Dean, Dean Perbolini, uh, it was really an honor to put together um, three parallel groups. Uh, so I, I coordinated um, these, well, three of my colleagues, Marcella del Signora, Pablo Lorenzo Eroa, and Christian Pongratz. Uh, so throughout the week uh, of, um, I think it was a, not seven days, it was about four and a half days or maybe three days of work uh, uh, from uh, uh, beginning to end with a sort of final review on the last day. Um, we don't really have much time for this, but I'll, I'll at least show the, the uh, profile pics of my, of my colleagues. I'll be presenting Marcella's group uh, today. Uh, Pablo Lorenzo Eiro will present his group uh, and Christian Pongratz is, is away and unable to join us. Uh, so the three uh, groups roughly correspond to three Masters of Science programs uh, at NYIT in Computational Technologies, Health and Design, and Urban and Regional Design. Uh, we, uh, we had 44 students, at least beginning with us, from 13 different countries uh, in these three workshops. So, the, so Pablo will present uh, Big Data, AI GANs, Informed Realism, and I'll present uh, in, a, in a moment Informed Urban Systems. Um, so with increased urbanization, um, 
and connectivity uh, in the in uh, um, uh, the informed urban systems uh, uh, group. Uh, what's triggered out of this context is a capacity to mine the availability, but also the capacity to mine information data directly from socio-technical systems embedded into urban environments. Uh, so that with increased urbanization uh, in this context, we're immersed in an, in, uh, an, in an entangled ecology of ubiquitous communication infrastructures from sensors, sensors, global position systems, automated systems to locative media. Uh, and so we looked at the possibility, latent possibilities of data in urban systems and the potential for communication uh, of those systems. Uh, as a, at the confluence really of technology public of the public realm uh, and the availability of uh, data related to socio-technical systems. Uh, much of this is all relate is all public uh, realm uh, domain uh, socio-technical systems. Um, open data uh, was the source for really everything that, that was produced in this workshop. Um, and what students did was they generated data narratives through a set of mapping strategies, focusing on data sets, uh, mapping dynamics using a set of interchangeable platforms. Uh, and what was sought is the relationships between urban environments and the socio-technical systems uh, issuing data. Uh, and so there are three sort of uh, sets of information, single autonomous, layered and comparative. Um, and we explored their codependencies. So between the 2D and 3D uh, systems, some of the results, um, uh, this is looking at uh, mobility and infrastructure and safety within Ist Istanbul uh, in 3D, uh, taking the, the, the map of, uh, this, of the city and various uh, mobility systems and, and crime data uh, overlaid onto it to kind of make uh, assessments, valuations, and conclusions uh, from these. We looked at a number of different uh, contexts, different groups looked at different contexts. Uh, this was um, uh, Arun Cherian looking at London, uh, confluence of cultural information, tourism, hotels, etc., uh, tourism spots, uh, hotspots, uh, and uh, relationships thereof. Uh, and a series of maps that sort of begin to highlight those sorts of conditions. Um, uh, this is uh, New York um, uh, 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 relationships between light, density, and public space, and Chicago the same. Uh, and also, uh, also New York, um, uh, confluence of, of information related to tourism, um, sources of social media, density, and mobility. Uh, also New York, uh, and uh, back in Chicago, um, uh, the, the public spaces along the waterfront, uh, in slightly more detail and in 3D. Uh, looking at dynamic or time-based mapping, um, the, uh, uh, once again, I think yeah, this is, uh, yeah, Istanbul, um, uh, between mobility, infrastructure, and safety. Um, and uh, this is well, back to London, Chicago, a little bit out of sequence, uh, and um, more dynamic mapping. This is also animation. Uh, I'm, I don't recall the time frame of what this animation is mapping, um, but on the kind of regional scale of, uh, of New York. Uh, okay, I will pass this now on to Pablo Lorenzo Eroa, who will present uh, uh, his workshop group. Hi, thank you, Tom. Thank you, Digital Futures, Inclusive Futures, for this uh, amazing set of workshops. I'm Pablo Lorenzo Iroa. I'm a director of the new MS in Architecture and Computational Technologies at New York Institute of Technology. And uh, I would like to start by addressing the radical changes that new technologies have been uh, influencing in architecture and urbanism. 
But uh, in relationship to that, to me, what's interesting is the confluence or the uh, interesting contrast between computational design and data science. And in that, uh, I developed a series of uh, informatics or charts that try to trace the transformation in terms of new emerging technologies related to architecture and what architecture can do in relationship to that. And uh, for instance, in my case, I'm interested in developing new technologies to address uh, new possibilities for architecture and addressing a new way of understanding authorship in relationship to architecture and urbanism. But one of the interesting things to me in the uh, contrast between computer science and data science is the flip between information and data in relationship to how we understand uh, reality and what we can do in relationship to that. Uh, and I'm not going to go through what is in the text of this uh, slide, but I invite you to maybe with more time uh, look at them. But to me, the, the flip between data and uh, information in relationship to computational, symbolic computational design is very interesting. To me, uh, this activates the issue of survey and the issue of, uh, of course, the repositories and how we access that data and what we do with that data and how we uh, go beyond the uh, relationships that are usually established in terms of authority and authorship, right? So to me, uh, one of the interesting things that I'm looking at uh, is the theory of science in relationship to new ways of addressing reality. And with this, uh, we have been focusing the late, uh, lately in simulation and uh, 3D scanning as a form of survey. To me, uh, what's interesting about the relationship between survey as capturing data and transforming that data relative to uh, artificial intelligence and some of the work that we're going to uh, show here in terms of the workshop that we did this year in uh, Digital Futures is a relation between the interface design and the form and try to activate problematic and expand relationship between the, uh, these type of problems. In that sense, to me, uh, what's interesting about the point uh, itself relative to the surface of the 1990s is that the point activates a new type of signifier, a new type of sign. And in that sense, the interest uh, that I've been searching after is to activate a new theory of sign relative to architectural signification and computational signification and of course, relative to computer science and data science. In that sense, to me, uh, we have been understanding computational design in a certain way, but I think that we are not able yet in architecture and urbanism to understand the reach of uh, data science in relationship to comput computer science. In that sense, uh, we have been working uh, for many years uh, in, uh, through simulation trying to invert the relationship between uh, modeling, the typical relation between architecture, between modeling, design, and uh, architectural agendas by flipping that equation and starting with uh, simulating reality through artificial intelligence, through intelligent systems, in this case, uh, swarm intelligence, and uh, addressing reality through different types of signification and different types of uh, means of understanding what's going on. So first, surveying reality, then understanding how we can intervene in the surveying of reality, uh, displace the conventional signifiers that are assigned by new technologies. In that sense, to me, that's important to identify that uh, new signifiers means that uh, architecture has a lot to do in relationship to that and not just simply incorporate la the latest technology, but address a certain uh, agenda in relationship to new technologies. Um, we have been working at urban level, architectural levels, at different levels, but mostly uh, one of the things that uh, have caught, captured my attention lately is how to understand data flow, how to understand what's going on in reality through different means of data gathering. Uh, first of all, uh, one of, to me, one of the political uh, instrumentalizations of this is how to develop your own data set, but also how to develop your own instruments of uh, data gathering. In that sense, for instance, in this case, we retrieve cell phone information through uh, Instagram and we develop a, a 3D scanning of the city by retrieving a social media post. Uh, for this uh, year's uh, workshop that we work with Tom Berber, so I appreciate Tom for organizing this, coordinating this series of workshops, we look at uh, thinking about inclusive futures, but how can you do that? Well, I think that we need to first deconstruct the inclusive past. What does it mean? 
Uh, I think that we need to uh, retrieve lost civilizations, lost, lost cultural heritages, and uh, create a global opportunity to, to understand what research is and to understand the relationship between periphery and center in different times. In that sense, we ask uh, students this year to uh, do data gathering in relationship to buildings that they were close to them, uh, cultural heritages, uh, uh, buildings that they had certain meaning for them, and uh, not only do a 3D scanning uh, using, in this case, uh, low technology because it was available to them uh, such a photogrammetry, but using uh, high technology in terms of uh, data processing and understanding different ways of, uh, first, understanding survey as an act of design, and then the transformation of that survey, the transformation of that information, the transformation of that input into a set of dynamic information systems that would allow students to understand reality differently and to transform that reality with a certain degree of uh, 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 authority and a certain degree of authorship in terms of their design agenda. In that sense, the, uh, we use uh, a combination between um, uh, uh, 3D big data gathering uh, using artificial intelligence, but also we use uh, GANs, generative adversarial networks, uh, understanding the relationship between data uh, acquisition and the displacement of data acquisition at the level of design, in this case, at the level of the point cloud, uh, through uh, dynamic processing and artificial intelligence at the molecular level or at the particle level, in this case, uh, of the 3D scan. So manipulating the existing information and aiming at displacing the existing information and creating new types of spaces out of the uh, 3D scanning. We did that also in addition to that, we did that uh, with uh, using GANs, but also using GANs in a different way, uh, using uh, image repositories, but trying to look among themselves, like in other words, uh, using the 3D scan and using the GANs to sort of retrieve the black box, uh, typical problem of AI, and try to index in the composition of the, uh, of the project a certain kind of recursive uh, loop in terms of the parallel processing that happens at GAN level in order to retrieve what's hidden or what could be the bias in the uh, image repository. Uh, in that sense, we work uh, both uh, with artificial intelligence uh, swarm systems at the particle level, but also we work uh, in a post-productive way, in a post-production way with uh, GANs, uh, looking at the transformation of the point cloud relative to uh, image repositories. Um, in that sense, the uh, projects uh, activate uh, a condition of a new signifier through the point cloud, but also the uh, idea that you can do a different type of realism you can activate uh, realism real time by retrieving the information uh, that we are gathering, but also uh, placing ourselves in terms of mediating that information and uh, understanding media determinism as a way of displacing that media determinism to activate a certain architectural agenda. In that sense, to me, uh, what we are trying to activate is a problematic relationship between computer science and data science thinking about computer science as symbolic computation through algorithmic complexity and parallel processing, but also uh, data science in terms of big data, information flow, and how uh, we can intervene at with weighting controls uh, at the information flow level and address a different type of realism by transforming that reality real time. Uh, usually I do not include uh, much of the process of how we arrive here because I'm interested in the final result to be uh, powerful enough and to index its own constitution so that the problems are at the level of the project and not and the, uh, to arrive to a certain degree of autonomy. I think that when we relate too much on the process in architecture, uh, we run the risk of uh, relegating the uh, relationship between uh, the uh, process and the final result and be not so much uh, aware of the biases in the final result. And in that sense, I'm much more interested in thinking that the final result can have a certain degree of autonomy, strong enough to actually 
uh, not only index the process, but actually, actually displays the uh, process on how it is constituted. So thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, just as a final note, as uh, Tom said, we're working on this new program at NYIT, Architect uh, Computational Arch uh, Technologies, in which we're going to be looking at uh, generating new technologies as emerging systems uh, for architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Pablo and Tom. Um, both are really amazing um, approaches to research and how we take data and make it our own and, and design through data. Um, really exciting work. I look forward to the discussion at the end. I think we've already got some um, questions coming through in the chat um, towards how we can discuss this. And also I appreciate the cultural um, relationship there as the uh, summer event was titled Inclusive Futures and really looking at what that means in our kind of uh, techno space and our physical space as well. Uh, so Mona uh, is going to present next her workshop, um, Kinetoscapes, um, Architecture of Performative Intelligence. And you can see here that we have intelligence running through all these um, presentations. So please take it away, Mona. Oh, great. You're muted. Yeah, thanks, Virginia. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Let me just keep track of time. And there you go. So thanks for joining my presentation on our workshop, Connectoscapes, Architecture of Performative Intelligence as part of Inclusive Futures uh, 2021. I'm presenting on behalf of our workshop team. So I will start my presentation with um, introducing the workshop team first. So I'm Mona Gandhi, the leader of the workshop team. I'm director of Morphogenesis Lab and assistant professor of architecture at Washington State University. And my interdisciplinary research, Architecture of Emotive Intelligence, focuses on cyber physical spaces and examines the role of artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotic, and uh, adaptive architecture in creating smart spaces that can learn from users' behavioral pattern in real time and enhance environmental quality. My lab is an interdisciplinary lab working at the intersection of architecture, art, and technology. Uh, using interactive architectural systems and artificial intelligence, we explore the potential for the built form to exist as an extension of the human body, serving as the embodiment of our collective needs and desire from the physical to the psychological. So our projects have been supported by National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, and Autodesk, to name a few. Um, together with Maria Mansouri, who is a lecturer at Washington State University and researcher at the Center for Infrastructure Renewal, Texas A&M University, we held this workshop. Mariam's interdisciplinary scholarship sits at the intersection of architectural design, engineering, and emerging technology. She specializes in the application of smart materials and geometries for adaptive architecture, buildings that are designed to respond to their environment. Mariam's recent research have been supported by National Science Foundation grants and her design proposal for alternative environment has been featured in NSF channel. The third member of our uh, workshop team was Marcus Bladesdell. He's a machine learning data scientist. Uh, he's, he recently got graduated in computer science from Washington State University. He has conducted research in emotion prediction with biometrics in morphogenesis lab here at WSU and has experiences in smart spaces, a physical computing and human computer interaction. His specialties is in data science, artificial intelligence and robotics. So we made a survey before our workshop starts to have a better understanding of our participants and their expertise, preferences and expectations. As you can see here, we had a pretty diverse workshop from all around the world with equal gender participant and different ethnicity. Um, that workshop um, uh, uh, holds, uh, and uh, it was well aligned with the purpose of this event, um, the inclusive future, which is supposed to provide higher education to anyone all around the world. And um, it, through those survey, we also see that how uh, diversity is also come to the level of education and the skill sets that in, in our participant and in our workshop team. And um, because it was an online workshop, uh, 
all the software in this workshop was either um, free or had a free trial. We used Rhino and Grasshopper to design and simulate, and we used Tinkercad, which is Autodesk online free software for coding, programming, and physical computing simulation. Uh, also, we used Dropbox for file sharing and Slack for communication, which was really handy. So let's talk about the workshop a little bit. Um, the the Connecto Space Escapes workshop offered its participant the opportunity to learn about responsive architecture and building adaptation to human and environmental stimuli. The most common type of responsive behavior, behavior system, which was the focus of this workshop, involved reversible geometrical transformation where the architectural element has self-adjusting capabilities and capacities uh, through a combination of robotized mechanisms, sensory environment, and material programming. By adopting a multi multidisciplinary approach, the workshop integrated architectural design thinking with algorithmic and programmable solutions. The workshop started with the introduction uh, of um, the topic and its uh, theoretical framework. Uh, in close collaboration with the instruction team, participant learn related material processes uh, and the current state of the art in responsive architecture. Uh, they design an adaptive system and train their, um, their projects and their design elements to sense and perform specific responses to variables such as temperature, light, human motion, etc. You will see the result in the workshop results very soon. And the participants learn about um, the design process involving dynamic automation, material programming, sensory environment, and intelligent behavior. They were expected to continue their design you know, research between the workshop sessions. Uh, all the final design were presented at a review session in the last day of the workshop with international uh, experts such as Stefan Kafi, Ayad Rahmani, and Sina Mustafavi. Stefan Kafi, uh, you know, was uh, from Texas A&M, and Ayad uh, was from Washington State University, and Sina was from uh, Delft. Um, so. Um, here is our workshop schedule. As you can see, we offered a six-day workshop. We had 18 uh, participants, and the project were team projects, and uh, they were collaboratively as a group of four to finish the project. Uh, and since you know the participants were not familiar, we kind of uh, based on the diversity in the skill set, uh, we grouped them at the beginning, and we had a good balance uh, between that. We had a couple of lectures around this topic to inform participants about the history, theory, framework, methods, technique, and the application of performative intelligence approach in architecture. Uh, as you can see, you know some of them focus on adaptive architecture. Some of them was focused on. Um, Grasshopper modeling and simulation, specifically focusing on adaptive architecture. Uh, some of them focusing on uh, physical computing, sensors and actuators, and some on programming. And I'm gonna discuss that later uh, in my presentation. So on the first day we had lectures and we talk about the framework of the performative uh, intelligence. We uh, expose a student to the uh, cyber, the fourth industrial revolution and uh, cyber physical spaces, which was the focus of the workshop, and then uh, inform them about the Internet of Things, uh, machine to machine communication, cloud computing, uh, cognitive computing, and data exchange. And they got familiar with the definition of adaptive architecture, the framework of the performative of architecture, the history of the kinetic architecture and uh, the overview of its progress throughout the time. And we also showed them some uh, good examples and precedents of adaptive architecture. Uh, and uh, then we discussed different adaptive system typologies, where it could be applied and what would be the applications of these adaptive systems. And then uh, we started you know, our second lecture by uh, focusing on the projects, how it will be. And on the second day, we, uh, at the beginning of the session, we had a you know, generic introduction to the grasshopper to make sure that all the participants are in the same level because we had a diversity and various skill set there. And then um, on the second um, workshop on, in the grasshopper, we focused on uh, 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 teaching them how to uh, create adaptive design in Grasshopper and simulate it uh, using other different stimuli. Uh, so students were exposed in depth to uh, five to six different examples and uh, learn how to use Grasshopper for this purpose. 
they were you know different adaptive mechanism um, that uh, they had different approaches so they were diff six different categories in the adaptive and responsive uh, system and they uh, walked through that uh, and then on the third day we had a question and answer and the fourth day was developing a design uh, with the inst instructors and the workshop team and then in the uh, day five, uh, we fully dedicated that day for programming and physical computing, how to write a code, make a circuit, work with sensors and uh, simulate the design. We started with presentation on the sensors and then showed them different projects using you know, different sensors from environmental to wearable sensors. And then we talk about, show them some examples of the actuators and uh, you know, different mechanism either they're mecha mechanical actuators or material programming, heat, electricity, magnetic field, and so on. So uh, they got exposed to all the different options that they have. They learn about uh, motor controllers and microcontrollers and Raspberry Pi and PC board. And then uh, using the Tinkercad, as I discussed, uh, it's a free online software that you can use for programming and coding while simulating the physical computing. We show them how they can write a code with code block or C++ in Tinkercad, and then uh, show them how they can uh, make a circuit uh, with different sensors and actuators, such as, for example, force sensors, range, light, or temperature sensors, and how they can work with different actuators uh, available in Tinkercad. Unfortunately, there were some limitation. It doesn't have all the different actuators. Um, then uh, we showed them how to code the system to see the changes, uh, you know, in the systems with different inputs uh, and test it with both C++ and code blocks so that they can get familiar with that. And um, with, uh, now I'm going to uh, show you uh, how the project results. So they work in a team, they in come with initial design, and then they started with the infographic, which you will see uh, very soon, which talks about the objective and methods or in general storytelling of what they want to do um, what is the adaptive uh, design uh, of, uh, and the mechanism of their adaptive design, which sensor they want to use, and they have to simulate, program, and actuate their design. So, um, I mean, at the end, each team should come up with uh, the, the deliverables as series of animations, videos, and uh, the diagram explaining the system mechanism, the application, and how it works. So this is the first project. Uh, the, this project focused on um, intelligent adaptive system for um, sailing HVAC system. And here you can see the infographic that tells you the whole story of the project, you know, such as using the body and temperature data, and then using the temperature and motion sensors, and also folding mechanism with uh, you know, linear actuators and smart material for actuating. And the, uh, the you know, application is on the uh, HVAC system to minimize energy consumption, cost, and noise uh, pollutions. So, um, the idea is kind of like the small modular ceiling that can act, you know, as a HVAC duct uh, cover. <clears throat> this system, you know, they, they talked about it that could be suitable for the large spaces with a small number of people, such as libraries and museums. And <clears throat> the ceiling acts according to each person's temperature. The system operates in uh, such a way that uh, the temperature sensors, which are connected to smart, you know, gadgets such as smart watches instantly uh, transmit body temperature to the smart roof and the roof or the installation uh, panel uh, open and close according to the needs of the people to provide their thermal comfort. So it's not the only having the opening and closing to provide the thermal comfort, but also um, the, uh, the, they have color code too. So the temperature image of the people falls on the ceiling panel so that the people can be informed about their body temperature. So the, the color being created on the installation is coming from the body temperature of the people who are around that area. So here you can see mapping temperature colors collected from sensors to ceiling panels and uh, patterns of motion uh, and how they can be different, uh, which also can result in better understanding of the comfort zone and the body temperature of the people around that. Um, the actuating system was a shape memory alloy, uh, which is a smart programmable material. 
and um, the te uh, temperature and motion sensor was used in this project to um, interact with the human body and the body temperature. And this is the code and Arduino simulation for uh, you know one temperature sensor and one LED light, which could be multiplied for different modules. And the second project uh, was a chroma, which was an interactive pavilion. And this project was uh, responsive to people motion and sun radiant. Uh, here you can see the infographic showing the roadmap. They use a sun path, lumen level, and physical movement as the input data by motion sensor and photovoltaic light and UV light sensor, and the temperature sensor to rotate the panels of um, the pavilion by smart material and mechanical actuators uh, and the application and the result was increasing shading and temperature regulation and observing uh, sun radiation to create light. So here you can see the operation of the uh, pavilion based on those stimuli that I just talked. Uh, this slide showing the sequence movement of the people and changes in the pa pavilion. This shows the sequence movement of the sun and changes in the pavilion. And here in this video, you can see the operation of the pa pavilion based on the sun and uh, human motion. So as you can see, you know, it, it can sense the presence of the people and it can change accordingly or uh, later you can see how the sun movement can start affecting the opening and closing of those panel in the pavilion. Uh, and then uh, here you can uh, see the, the adaptive system mechanism that they use, the video of that, uh, that how it's performed using the shape memory alloy, the code that they use to operate the panels with the sensors and the physical computing simulation. Uh, and th this project was focused on interactive Orsi pavilion, which is the traditional uh, Iranian architectural elements that um, you know, uh, capture different radiance of the um, sun and create a very interesting uh, effect uh, in the uh, project. Uh, the participant decided to take this idea and make it interactive and expand this method uh, further than a facade and implement it into alternative architectural elements uh, and uh, using you know, the kinetic layers of uh, three different color, red, green, and blue. Uh, here you can see the infographic. And in this video, you can see this is the traditional um, idea of that and how they make, made it interactive three-dimensional and more uh, create more immersive experience and sensory experience for the people. So um, this uh, created from series of uh, extended shroud, uh, they using they use the smart material, shape memory alloy to um, uh, uh, operate those, um, they goes up and down and the modules on the top, they, it has three different layers of blue, green and red, uh, which you will see in this slide. Uh, with the uh, linear actuators and shape memory alloy, how they operate and how they can capture different um, color uh, in the space and create the immersive sensory environment. So here is the code and the animation of the physical computing simulation. You can see that by changing different data in different sensor. Here you can see two sensors and three servos that how they will be uh, affected by the data changes in each sensors. And the last project was an in, uh, interactive uh, facade, parking facade to uh, uh, adapt itself to the sun to provide a share uh, natural air, view and shading. And uh, it also interact with the people presence. Here you can see the infographic, the mechanism and how it works uh, and how it can expand and shrink uh, to provide a different um, sun um, shading and view for the people um, and uh, create the parking spaces more pleasant. So as I mentioned, um, um, this is uh, the six day workshop and we had <laughs> three hours workshop per day. Uh, so um, it was a lot of work that has been done with the student getting exposed to coding, programming, physical computing and everything was a lot. And we are so happy that we had a great participant to come up with this good result. Just want to mention that this uh, participant was very uh, motivated about the project. They it developed it very well. But the interesting part is that they keep working on that and developing it. And some of them are publishing a paper together. Some of them are making it as a, um, a real project in their country. And um, we hope that our participants can continue and develop this approach as we believe that the performative intelligence uh, 
uh, uh, and performative intelligent architecture uh, is the future of the design, which is respectful to environment and human well-being. At the end, I would like to thank the Digital Futures team and uh, to make this a uh, great event happen and provide this opportunity to all people around the world to learn and get exposed to new ideas. Thanks. Thank you so much, Mona. Um, I have to say, like, this is really impressive also for the amount of um, work that went on in, in, in one week of workshop. Um, and I would love to see some of those things built too, because at, at this point they are kind of just renderings, but they're, they're kind of amazing renderings and to actually see them in the physical world would be very exciting. So yeah, I it was all students... online. And again, I yeah. think we were, we were lucky that we could use Tinkercad to at least simulate and see how it works. But yeah, yeah. hopefully next year we can build them <laughs> and yeah. interact them in it person. It would be amazing um, if you, you can. Um, and I know that you also have to leave. Um, so if there are any questions uh, for Mona um, and her team, uh, people on YouTube, you can send them through and we can um, get her to try to answer them quickly through chat and respond. But otherwise, thank you so much for your presentation. Thanks, um, Virginia, and thanks to the team. Yeah, next we will have Nnedi Odor, and um, I don't know if your partner Sadia will also help you present, um, but I'm going to share my screen because I have your presentation here, and you just let me know when you want me to uh, change slides or anything like that, but everyone see uh, Nnedi's presentation? Yeah, I can see it. All right, great. So okay. welcome. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much for having us. Uh, our workshop was themed, was a theory workshop, which is digital and forgetting. We were essentially working around archives and think, rethinking archives and how we can move archives forward, thinking about them in terms of using technology or digital tools. Um, my name is Nedi. I am a graduate of the South Institute of Architecture. My partner also is my partner is also Sad Sadia. She also graduated from DIA. Um, I'm currently um, an an a curation and research intern at the Canadian Center of Architecture, and Sadia runs um, a speculative uh, speculative architecture program called Altopia. So we had um, six participants from countries ranging from Iran, India. Um, Kenya, which is me, Bangladesh. And um, so we were thinking around archives and we thought we thought of asking the participants what they thought around archives. And these are some of the reflections from the mirror board. Before we had not really stretched out um, our thoughts around archives in, in digital form. Um, next. The next slide. Can you see the next one now or one more? Yes, uh, that's it. So we started with archives as we know them. So this is historic, uh, start from the prehistoric times and thought as man evolved, archives have also evolved because man has always needed to sort of record what they, they did or to record in terms when it started, when civilization started in Ali Mesopotamia, there was need to record um, produced from the revolution, from the agricultural revolution that started, then moving on to the revolution of archives, which uh, began during the age of revolutions, essentially after the French revolution where modern public archives were <clears throat> sort of institutionalized. And then within these times, within these periods, we had, we all asked questions of what was missing, what was sort of not mainstreamed as an archive, because archives as you know them have sort of um, have influenced the knowledge system that we have right now. If you think about it in architecture, in science, in modern medicine, the archives that are present have influenced the way the knowledge systems right now are created. Uh, next slide. And so these, um, we thought of then archives as as they started, they had said they were started, uh, they evolved to become tools of power, tools of dominion. So when um, 
when when great nations, when nations like the 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 French nations were going to other areas and you know stealing archives as a form of of domination and uh, amplifying their own archives as a, to show that to show power within certain regions and also the destruction of archives as a as a way of wiping out entire civilizations or wiping out entire peoples. These are also some of the critiques we had of the archives. And so in thinking about archives as they were and how they shaped the knowledge systems that we have, we also had to think about the archives that we could have known that we don't know of because they were destroyed or because they were uh, they they fell under the tools of domination. Next slide. And so um, again, as I said, from the evolution of archives, you know, of archives moving like the our current museums evolved from the cabinets of curiosities. So we also had questions of um, uh, cabinets of atrocities. So archives, as we know them right now, the museums, the great institutional archives have um, histories around them that are histories around them that are not necessarily mainstream. So we think about the Benin bronzes that are in the British museums that were taken from African countries, Western African countries, or um, some of the archives that were destroyed by colonial by colonial rulers, for example, the British destroyed archives in from from their from the from the colonial states in in for example Kenya and India to sort of uh, erase the, the actions in these countries. So Generally, this was just us rethinking in the archives that we know what are the kind of the critiques that we have of them and how these can shape how we think about the archives of the future. Mm, next slide. So archives, archives as they were have sort of been shaped by technology. So here we see the sort of the, the pyramids as they've been archived with evolving of technology. So there's the use of, when when Ali Man started, there was the use of the opposable thumb that helped, allowed them to, to use tools and then, which allowed also to for linguistic development. Then from linguistic development, you had the wheel and the wheel uh, allowed for travel. And then so information was moving across civilizations. Then we move into the printing press and, and then it's also, this generally revolutionized archives as we know them. And then this, because writing and then the formaliz formalization of archives was, was possible. Then we move into like the photography and motion pictures, which also very much influenced the digital records or digital uh, archiving as you know them. And so this is all sort of like looking at how technology directly influences the way archives are set up or the way archives have evolved. And so thinking about this would help us to see how rethinking, how thinking of the future of archives also in, involves thinking of how technology is evolving right now and this can, how can, this can shape the way we archive right now. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Right, and so we analyzed, um, we looked at the Plato's myth of, of Tamas, Tamas, the previous slide, please. Sorry, it. Yeah, uh, before that actually. Before this and before, two slides before this. Yes, so Themis of uh, and thought is, is um, a myth that's told of, of a great thinker that went to the king with all these um, knowledge systems that he had created. And he thought of writing and said writing of all of them would be the most, um, would be most used by man and would be most um, viable. And the king said, uh, this may not be truth because the writing will, will sort of erase memories and will lead to forgetfulness about um, amongst man. And this was interesting for us in, in analyzing because it, it sort of uh, brings, goes back to the, to how we analyze archives and how we have knowledge systems that are sort of mainstreamed and knowledge systems that are not necessarily mainstream. So we think of it as amplifying 
a form of knowledge amplifying a form of an archive will eventually erase some form of it and also what are the effects of these on certain memories so this is how we start on the history of forgetting uh, the next slide and so we moved into the history of forgetting like what what um leads to our forgetting of our collective mem uh collective memory loss so this is um the cost units for my personal um i did my bachelor's in 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 kenya in kenya in africa and these were the cost units for for generally my my till my third year so as you can see history and history and history and theory of architecture is taught um twice in my first year second twice in my second year and then for my third year it's taught history and theory of african architecture this was a bit interest this is interest not interesting for me but interesting to think back because i was first introduced in my formal formal teaching of architecture i was first introduced to doric and ionic columns as opposed to the kind of columns that i interacted with as a child because every single person in my class we were all um, Kenya natives we all had interactions with vernacular architecture from when we were children in our rural areas our grandmothers lived in um in, in architecture that is vernacular but in our formative years we were taught about you know the modern the modernist the postmodernist um postmodernist styles and even when we were taught about African architecture, it was thought as a, as a form of novelty, not necessarily as a style or some form of canon. And this, this was one of the things that sort of um, influenced me or, or influenced me to sort of look at archives and how we interact with archives and how these archives shape what is canonized. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Uh -huh. um, again, going back to canon and canonized um, knowledge. So we we know of 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 systems that are knowledge systems that are canonized even in architecture. And you think about it in terms of, um, for example, less is more. Uh, less is more is there are there are facets of it that do make sense. But then you think about it in terms of for vernacular architecture or vernacular systems of knowledge is less really more because sometimes more is is um, is cultural. It's it's is based off of cultural, ecological, spiritual, functional, or structural tenets of a society or tenets of a of a, of a knowledge system. And this for us was was important to look at. Um, next slide. <coughs> Excuse me. And so this led us to looking at indigenous knowledge systems as <coughs> as knowledge systems at the margins. So we know about canonized knowledge, you know about knowledge that is archived and then it becomes um, it becomes canon, but then we don't know about the knowledge at the margins which for us was traditional knowledge. Each of us has interacted with some form of knowledge that we cannot necessarily bring into formal spaces non, um, because it's not uh, seen as a viable system of knowledge. So for example, as I was learning about architecture, um, bringing in uh, what I had interacted with as a child or as 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 someone who was coming was growing up, which is like the traditional forms of of building, I could I could not bring into a formal space, or even if I brought it to a formal space, it was some form of novelty. But then, if you think about these kinds of knowledge and how they interact with the way we live, they are directly interact to land and resources and the ecology and how we interact with them. They are very concerned with the the way we live day to day they are not necessarily systemically systematically documented because again the form of documentation that is it, it's passed on through then it's very rooted in how we make decisions and our survival strategies in terms of like um uh, indigenous uh communities etc and it's a very dynamic and based on innovation and adaptation because if you think about how um indigenous indigenous uh, communities have interacted, for example, with climate change. They had interacted with ecology in a certain way. And with climate change, they also had to change, they also had to change their ways. So it is based off of innovation and there is adaptation and experimentation within that. Then it's very oral and rural in nature. It's generated by communities. So it's very communal. So there is no, uh, there is no, um, 
there's no one shaman that says that this 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 is the this is the the a form of knowledge i came up with it and that and that's this is canon and also it's very cultural and location specific which is important for us because thinking about archives in terms of context was very specific to how this workshop was run um moving on next to the next slide please Yes, so we had to think about um, uh, what was not archived. So these are the archives that you don't necessarily see in 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 mainstream archives, and we had to think about why they are not in that way. Uh, so we thought about um, oral tradition, artisanship, familial heirloom. So what is passed down within the family, the ecological coexistence. So the knowledge that is not. Um, written down, for example, a community's interaction with the river, or uh, which is their water system, that's that's also a form of knowledge, sacred space and object. And for some of these communities, these are very sacred in a way that it's not necessarily not written down, but it does not does not leave a community. So it's very sacred to that community. So it's not necessarily um, in, in a mainstream archive. It's also communal delegation, ceremonies and tradition, a spiritual passing down. Um, we had to think about if if it cannot be written down, it, it cannot be said. For example, if it's spiritual, how how does that communicate in an archive of the future? And also thinking about daily life because daily life sometimes is said to be mundane, but it's very critical to how um, indigenous communities operate. How then do we think about archives in this in this um, in this light? Next slide, please. And so then we had we thought about memory because uh, we had come to the conclusion within the discussions is there is a form of memory loss or a form of forgetting that has happened, especially with those of us who have interacted with formal formal systems of knowledge. There is a form of of forgetting that has happened. So there is individual, uh, if you think about memory in terms of like biology and psychology and social and cultural, um, the tenets of memory is it's either individual or it's collective. We thought more of thinking around collective memory and thus thinking of collective memory moving forward, collective memory that um, we've interacted with, that we have passed, that has been passed down on, on us and rethinking this memory and moving forward to the future of it. Um, I think in the next slide, I'll discuss this, but uh, then we thought of uh, there's the concept of the memory machine. So these are the, the system that control the data and the collective memory what if you think about the politics of memory and then how as a collective we have a certain understanding of certain periods of time so if you think about for example nazi germany or if you think about world war one there is a collective memory around that but you have to think about what shapes this memory so you think about historical figures the politic for the politics of a country uh, so for the politics of a country could influence the collective memory of a people um if you think about the media, the media is very, uh, right now, for example, is very um, crucial in shaping the kind of memory as a collective that we have. So then we think about memory machines right now, we think about data and uh, we thought of, 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 for example, the Facebooks and the Googles that are sort of in control of our data right now. It's a sort of controlling of our collective memory. It's within certain periods of time. So it's to think of a collective is to think of a way of moving towards the future that is, that removes agency from memory, the big memory machines and moves it to a collective or to thinking about uh, to reshaping the way we have collective memory that is devoid of control from larger systems and is sort of controlled by the public. Uh, moving on to the next slide. And so we had to think about our own memories and our personal um, interactions with sort of which kinds of memories we think are are forgotten. At first, our, um, I think the participants had not um, the participants didn't really have the the yeah the participants didn't really have um, a larger grasp of what memory could be or what an archive could be. They had a sort of grasp of, of what is the mainstream and what is um, what is uh, the mainstream or what is like 
canon. So some of the memories that we had, for example, were like uh, someone thought of their grand their grandparents' stories and their food and recipes, and these were just passed down between the grand his grandparents and him. And also thinking about um, he's also he was also a collector of of printed metro maps, which we found very interesting. Then someone else thought of um, virtual conversations and local old stories. Um, another person thought of the city and how the story of a city can can be told be between different people and how that can shape what the city will look, what the archive of the city will look like. Then there was the special experience. Someone thought of, of archiving special experiences. There's also a thought of archiving um, a collective memory and groceries. Then we had a student that was a student in Spain, but had come from China and they had, um, they had access to manuscripts. They had access to manuscripts in Spain, but these same access was not allowed for them in China because the Chinese manuscripts for for architectural manuscripts was was um, was was not accessible. And so they wanted to see like the the kind of cross cultural exchange that could go between the way archives are accessible. Then there was the uh, archiving of progress progression of personal mental health. Then um, uh, one that we look for we look into much later was uh, the urban duo kitchen, which um, looked at an urban kitchen and how it differs from the kinds of kitchens that were there in traditional times and what kinds of of processes have been lost or have been forgotten because the urban kitchen is set up in a certain way. Then there was um, a kitchen tool from Bangladesh that. Um, someone wanted to unforget, then there was the behind the product, so different products that are made by artisans and how they are losing or, or they're becoming more commercial. And so they're losing that, that value they wanted to. So this is the mirror board where we're kind of just uh, brainstorming on, on our memories, our collective memories and the things we'd like to unforget. My next slide, please. And so then we had to um, think about um, the future of archives or where, where we would move forward in terms of with archives. So we thought about it in terms of the, rec the recording, the collection, the preservation, uh, spreading and access and the interaction. Um, so we, 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 we explored the different ways and the, uh, the different forms of, of what could be an archive. In the end, we, had, uh, we actually had questions of, of, is everything an archive? Am I an archive? What can be archived and what cannot be archived? Um, but what was key for us was thinking about memory, um, memory data, memory that becomes because we think of when we're thinking about it in terms of, of of a digital space we think of the digital space and the and the we think of the digital space and the interaction with data because it's very data influenced so can our memories um or these things that we have forgotten become a sort of data uh data base that then leads to an archive and these are the questions we had so we thought of um the different uh forms of archiving that are sort of new right now so cryogenics um uh, ar and vr um we also discussed um nfts and these and these new forms of 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 sort of storage or preservation of of knowledge or knowledge and archives and um, so this interaction is very important to us, the memory to data to archive. And then this archive goes back to being memory. If you think about this interaction and we sort of ask the, the participants to think about their archives in these, thinking about it in a cyclic form of, of if we're going to go into the future and the future is, I mean, very heavily data-based, we have to think of, and right now we always have the discussion of, um, um, systems being biased because the data that is being presented is one not intersectional enough. It's not um, it's not intersectional enough one, and also it's it's not diverse enough. So if we're thinking about the memories that have been forgotten, and these memories are at the margins because of again systems, can we think about the digital being a sort of subversion because we have uh, museums and archives and and um, books etc still being under still being directed and being moved by you know the the systems of domination so governments and schools and etc then we think about indigenous knowledge that doesn't necessarily run under these systems of 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 domination can we think of um 
the digital as a sort of subversion or the digital as a sort of bridging between this. So then the digital comes in in the form of data and then we create, we are the we are the holders of memory, either collective or individual, and then this forms an archive. Um, uh, next slide, please. And so then we had, um, I think in the in the in a span of like a day because we had a four day uh, workshop, we the participants had to come up with um, one memory and how they would wish to archive it. So this is Shashank. Shashank is from India, and he's a collector of of um, metro maps. And so we we had a discussion with him around how he thought these metro maps one could tell the story of a city. So the the metro maps are. Uh, sort of a way of navigating the city, but then uh, the way we navigate cities has changed over over time. So we thought of this as it, it could be an interesting archive of of um, that's multi layer that tells the story of the city. And so he came up with um, a sort of digital interface that was interactive because it was also important to us in formulating these archives. We we, we um, essentially had to space place ourselves to be either the archive creator the archival curator or the user of the archive. In this space he created, he made himself, uh, he placed himself in this position of an archival creator and an archival curator. And it was interesting, The um, he thought of it, of it being a sort of um, way of experiencing the city within different interfaces. Um, it's, it's not necessarily, it's not, uh, a lot of these ideas are not necessarily fleshed out, it's just ideas we had within um, a day of, of sort of the digital tools we could use for the archiving. Um, I forget, moving on to the next slide. Uh, then we have Sadaf. Sadaf is from Iran, and she does. She has research around the archive, the city as an archive, and so she we, she thought of thinking of the of having a digital platform that is um, a repository for the mem a memory of Tehran. So she thought of having a platform where it is open source, where here again she is the archival curator, where different people can come in and give the, their memory of Tehran or different spaces within Tehran. And these can be sort of layered and create a, diff, a story of it. And it gives open access to researchers and um, different curators or people who want to interact with the city of Tehran. And um, then this created the, the archive of the city of Tehran. Uh, next slide. Then we had Nahayan. Nahayan is from Bangladesh, and hers was um, she thought of the memory of, of, of memory of a tree and how within different locales there's, for example, a, a story that's related to a tree or a bridge, and there would be an urban myth around a bridge or a certain space, and the space there would be a certain story about a space. She thought of because these stories are mostly usually urban myths or they're usually um, very oral, traditional based. She thought of having an archive of sorts of this. So if she had these iconographs or these landmarks, if she created a sort of um, mapping tool that would have a repository of these stories. So these stories that are related to certain iconographs or for example, if there was a tree and there's a story about a tree in this certain region, then whoever interacted with this map would have um, access to these, to these stories. And this could go across um, different cultures because it was interesting to us when she was telling us about the story. There was always in each locale, for example, in my country, there was, there's definitely a story around um, this tree. There's a great Muguma tree, which is a great spiritual tree. And in Bangladesh, there's the same. What, what if this happened in different geographies and different locations? Then we have these, um, local and old traditional myths that have um, an archive of sorts and then having that layered over each other and having it on an interactive map was her way of thinking of an archive of these uh, stories. Um, next, next slide. Um, then we had a student from China and she thought about collective memory around groceries. So she uh, she had research that was looking at how 
um, people interacted with buying groceries between a certain, within different periods of time. So from the 1960s, there was a certain, um, there was a certain culture of, of interacting with groceries and then moving on to the 2010s. And she thought of having this as an archive over the years and seeing one, for example, consumer, consumer traditions, and then also seeing how uh, this can be um, a great research point for thinking about how people interact with, with different artifacts or different things, like for example, food and how buying, 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 uh, patterns have changed within different time and this can be for different areas or different um, places for and also can help for with people who are one setting up um for example uh areas of buying food or areas of growing food how does how do they interact with these buying trends or these consumer trends uh within the groceries um yeah next slide Then this was um, this is one where we had a lot of discussions on. This is the navigating access to restricted architectural manuscripts. So this student was is is a, is a student in Spain and uh, an architectural student studying architecture in Spain, but she comes from China, and so she was speaking about how in in Spain it was easier to get access to manuscripts than it was in China because in China the manuscripts are restricted again because uh, manuscripts are very very protected because of um, one the cultural value they, the the cultural political value that they have and also because they are delicate and so we had discussions around navigating access in terms of because if you think about it. Um, different forms of archives are, are restricted for different ways. How can we use the uh, digital to, to bridge this? So we had we, we had thought around X-ray tomography, which is what is described here, which is like um, um, a, a tool that uses X-ray to, to look into manuscripts and then uh, creates a sort of 2D or 3D um, visualization of the same. Uh, we also had discussions around thinking about if if uh, if the government or the schools in China have uh, an issue with um, with, for example, um, the manuscripts being stolen or or this move going out into other places. So thinking about um, things like NFTs and blockchains that sort of create this sort of um, they don't necessarily bridge privacy, but they could create a, a system where the Chinese. Um, the Chinese government or Chinese uh, institutions are feel much safer within a digital space to give access, but then not lose uh, or give full access to to the students. Um, she's still thinking about this. She's doing her PhD on, I think, manuscripts, and so she's still researching this. And it was it was it was interesting to think about the discussions around around also the levels of access of we want to move. Um, archives into the into the future, but then we also have to think about the archives that are being held on too tightly and how we move we move them into the future without necessarily losing the value of what they actually already are. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, then there's the the memory of space and the collective collective memory on the way we lived. Um, I think I'll give after I present the last one. I'll give this to Sadia to, to sort of present because she's she's my work, other workshop participant, and um, it was interesting the way she thought about um, space that is space that is not um, formally created. So space space that we have, for example, for gossip, for for sitting, and and this is space that's not formally created, but then this it's space that does exist in in communities, and it's used in a certain way. She'll present much later. Then on to the next one, please. And so this this is um, for me. My memory was of. Uh, a Lua kitchen. So um, I am from from Kenya, and I come from a, a group of people called the Luo, and the Luo live mostly on the western side of Kenya. And we um, have certain um, ways of cooking, <clears throat> certain methods of cooking, and certain tools that are spe particular to the forms of cooking. So for me, my the memory was. Um, uh, I had asked a few of, of the women in my family and people who interact with the Luo kitchen, what are some of the things that you could do in a traditional Luo kitchen that you can't do in an urban kitchen? So the, the circular um, plan at the top is what a Luo kitchen 
a traditional Luo kitchen looks like. And then the one at the bottom is what an urban, urban kitchen looks like. So for me, the forgetting was in urban kitchens don't create space for the variety of activities that happen in a Luo kitchen. So for example, in, in, in where in my in our urban home, my mother has the urban kitchen, but then she's also created a separate space where she does the activities, for example, the, the fermentation and the drying of, of certain foods and the certain 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 forms of, of, of cooking that cannot be accommodated in an urban kitchen. So I thought this of, of this memory, what if memory could be a form of database um, for for different um, from, for example, here I thought oh, I used the Akigan, the Akigan um, machine learning med model. So if we have these memories and these memories, because these memories can be translated into space, the way we interact with space is also directly related to our memories. But the way we create the urban space has been created. Some of these memories have to be forgotten and some of these memories have to have space outside of them. So I thought of thinking about mapping these memories into, into space and then mapping it into an urban space. If we can have um, a sort of uh, a kitchen that's, uh, that moves with, with, with whatever um, activity that wants to happen. So um, if we think about uh, mapping it and mapping the particular, particular activities onto an urban kitchen. So then here with the input to different places would be more ideal for different spaces. So for example, um, for drying of fish, then we should have that. And then if I, the Akigan method is essentially a configuration of space. So it's the, my, the machine learning model is, is, is essentially generating different space according to uh, of a, a database, for example. So I thought of thinking it's not really fleshed out yet and not really well uh, thought out. So I thought of what if this database database could be the memories and the and the mapping of memories onto uh, different spatial uh, configurations. Um, then next slide. I think before the next slide, Sadia will present her, Sadia will present her, her archive. Uh, I don't think she's there. Okay, anyway. So in, in the long run, we thought of, um, from our discussions, we thought of um, the different, this is still a growing thing. And we thought of the different ways if, when unforgetting or creating an archive, what one has to think ab about. So the archivists cannot remain impartial. They have to, you have to identify your position as an archival creator, a curator or user from points of privilege or experience within archival gaze. Then memory is fallible and easily influenced. Collective memory, memory helps to reconcile what one might forget, but even collective memory can be challenged as we, have, as we have discussed in the politics of memory and what influences collective memory. Then identify diverse tools of archiving, collective imagination to new ways of life, new ways of life and knowledge systems that move further away from hierarchies of domination. Then there was a question of why digital? Um, this was a question we asked a lot then, um, we thought of the digital can be a reliable tool of subversion. So creating alternative space for archives and bridging gaps between the levels of access. So if you think about um, museums and institutional archives and how they are regulated, then can the digital, not necessarily because it's unregulated, can the digital create space um, create space for what is not uh, institutionalized? Then you have to rethink appropriation and crediting of the knowledge system that you interact with. Um, uh, you have to rethink the appropriation and the crediting of the knowledge systems interacted because I think indigenous knowledge is very sensitive. Indigenous knowledge is very is very um, very close to the communities that that have them and communities that interact with them. It's important as people, for example, who come from uh, who are interacting with these knowledge uh, from a point of privilege, to think about how appropriation how appropriation has influenced. Um, uh, the marginalization of these groups and how proper crediting one can lead to these becoming viable systems of knowledge and um, actually having them sort of being mainstreamed, even if, if, if we need to mainstream knowledge in that way, um, still a growing um, form of knowledge. And that is, that is our, that was our workshop. Thank you for having us.
Thank you so much, Nidhi. Um, the presentation was a little bit long, but I understand how uh, important the cultural implications of these archiving systems are. Um, and we will really quickly have a last presentation by Gustavo Rincon. Um, I know that uh, some of our presenters do have to leave um, pretty quickly at uh, noon or um, in the next 20 minutes. So Gustavo, I'll, I'll make it quick. <laughs> I'm going to go super quick. And, right, give me one sec. <laughs> um, if you have any questions on YouTube, please send them through now. Uh, so that we can forward them to the panelists. Um, and panelists, please uh, feel free to use the Zoom chat to ask questions to each other um, as well um, and start the discussion there before um, we move on. All right, do you, Gustavo, do you see the this? floor is all yours. Do you see yes, the screen? Yes, we see it. Okay, yes. perfect. All right, so um, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, uh, Virginia, and I'm very thankful for the Digital Futures teams and my peers here. Um, so today I will talk about conversations on inclusivity series. Um, <clears throat> it's very nuanced and there was a lot of discussion behind it, but I'm I'm just one person of a group. I'm uh, other colleagues are Biana Bogosian, Virginia Melnick, and Marina Rodriguez Dasnieves. Uh, let's begin. Uh, here's my team. Uh, it was a lot of discussion. Um, what is inclusivity? Uh, what kind of conversations can we have? Um, it could get very contentious very quickly, but as architects, uh, I think we had different perspectives and we were trying to define what architecture is uh, in this stage uh, in time. This is our statement. Sorry, it's texty, but I just wanted you to be aware it's on the website. But the idea is that we're open to all voices, all races, all creeds, all genders. We want to make the world better. And it, I, we believe in the multitudes, not the, not the one. Uh, I'll read this. Uh, this uh, basically contextualize our series. Today, we confront radical and accelerated change in all aspects of human existence. This recent global crisis is also a time to rethink exist, ex existing modes of operations and initiate a new range of innovative possibilities. This vision requires a new uh, conversations to inspire behavioral and systemic change to address shared local and global problems, including climate change, social, political, and economic inequality. We ask our community of artists, architects, and authors curators, entrepreneurs, scientists, policymakers, and scholars to share their research in pursuit of starting to formulate the seeds of a new paradigm shift and reconstructing our future environments. That was a big mouthful, but the idea is that we want to hear from you. Um, and the conversation with inclusivity um, really required a lot of the ideas of critical design, thinking, computation, and we just wanted to get a, a robust dialogue. Uh, this is our first panel. Our speakers were Professor Marcos Novak, Andres Burbano, Joanna Musbeck, uh, Peter Poshar from Hellowood, and Pamela L. Jennings from Constructs. This panel foregrounds the role of questions of existing educational and pedagogical models for addressing contemporary issues in the creative fields. How can evolving technologies aid our educational institutional systems to better adapt to existing societal change? How do we learn together and collaboratively move beyond the confines of the institution? Uh, here are some slides. This is from Professor Novak. He actually talked about his research on education his uh, 40 years of research in um, cyberspace, uh, transvergence, uh, looking at the different paradigms of um, architecture, uh, real and non-real. Andres Burbano, who's part of Seagraph and looking at the history, historical figures within Seagraph. He talked about the ideas of publications, the archive, uh, looking at education as a mechanism for change, bringing knowledge from South America to the world and not, uh, not acknowledging blindly Western knowledge uh, for uh, knowledge sake. This is a project, uh, Hollywood, um, 
Hello Wood, sorry, um, from two collaborators talking about the initiative of children and schooling and architecture. Uh, Pamela L. Jennings, she was a part of an NSF initiative for funding the arts. Uh, she spoke about her company and her understanding of a new vision or paradigm for change. Uh, to your right, I want to bring to your attention, I did a, kind of a word cloud analysis of the transcripts. So everything was transcribed. We made sure that it was accessible to everyone. Uh, we had a robust conversation. This was this is a part of my research, which is near and dear to me as an educator for a few decades. I want to understand and challenge the paradigms of power and education. Our next panel is a rising social agendas. Here are our speakers, Liliana Gosling Gallegos, Alejandro Hayek, Maria Lucia Borja, and Sean Connolly. Read this quickly. While the pandemic has changed our world, rising social agendas have continued to overturn governments and change social awareness. How can different community models influence our decision making? And what can we learn from existing models? How can a participatory design change our economic and political futures? Here's my colleague, Marina. Alejandro. Uh, Liliana Consulate Gallegos, her discussion on decoloniality and looking at progressive knowledge was very inspiring. Um, and I would uh, recommend that we all uh, take a look at that in architecture. Sean Connolly talked about the idea of um, the colonizer coming in and putting in a different non-Indigenous knowledge within the land. Uh, this was a really great group talking about the collaboration of different types of typologies and construction using uh, local materials. Again, the word cloud, and if you've noticed to your right, there's a lot of no, but it changes slightly. Knowledge, way of thinking, indigenous knowledge. The next uh, panel is on computation. This one got contentious. Um, our panelists, uh, I'll read this briefly. This panel addresses the role of critical computation and the relationship to information. How has innovation changed our relationship to institutional power and our global economies? What new societal potentials does AI and digital metaverse and quantum computing bring in both near and distant futures? Computation deals with a lot of issues of bias. What are the ways that we need to change to make computation more inclusive and ethical? This is Dr. Uh, Joanne Cochero Marin and the Alice Fear instrument at UCSB at CNSI, uh, the, my, the current lab that I serve in. This is uh, Calneil uh, Cordosa Lac, who talked about the critical imagination and computation. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with his work at CMU, but he talks about the history of computation, the origins, and how it influences current thought today and we should be aware of the origins of that type of technology. Uh, uncanny views from uh, Anuradna Vikram. She is an amazing writer and researcher. She looks at different uh, versions and um, uh, epochs in art, but uh, this um, lecture talked about the idea of artificial intelligence and uncanny views in an exhibition. Uh, Andrew Culp is a philosopher. He uh, leads a few groups. Uh, he's from CalArts. He's uh, Deleuze and Guattari. Uh, I would say he's one of the experts in the field. He wrote a book on them called Dark Deleuze. Uh, I would recommend uh, you invite him to your schools and colleges for lectures. He is extremely insightful and very, um, very dynamic educator and thinker. Here's the word cloud. Uh, second to last presentation. Uh, this is for environmental uh, justice and issues. This panel aims to highlight the nuance of complex nature of environment issues by focusing on the role of design, data management, mapping, geopolitics, and the process of creating environmental literacy and policy. Our speakers were Ricardo Dominguez from UCSD, Gabriel Kozlowski from MIT, Hadley Arnold, Arid Lands Institute, and Joshua Dawson. My colleague, Diana Bogosian, organized this panel. 
here are some of the issues that we're confronting. And what was interesting is we try to recontextualize this to look at environmentalism, civil rights, social justice, racism, data management, and to look at policy and environmental literacy. And I'm moving very briefly just to keep time. Here's the word cloud. Our last panel and my colleague here can speak about this. Uh, take it away. Yep. Yeah, so I um, chaired this last panel with um, Sean Alquist, Alexa von Brian, Bernard, Ava uh, Agenchuk, Jonathan Duckworth sent in a video because he was in Australia and the time frame didn't work for him, and Rachel Dickey. Uh, and this panel was on disability in the human body. Gustavo, next slide. Uh, and so the panel was meant to explore non standard bodies and how we design for them and with them. Uh, and how does design and technology account for all of our bodies? Ultimately, the, the conversation really started to discuss much more about sensory space rather than the body um, and how we were able to perceive um, our built environment and interact with it. Uh, next slide. Uh, so Alexa presented on deafscapes um, and how deaf humans perceive their environment and interact with their environment. Next slide. Um, Ava also presented on um, people with different um, perceptions and also some, uh, she presented specifically on some nonverbal experiences and how we can communicate. Next slide. Um, Rachel Dickey um, presented several projects that were relating to different disabilities um, between uh, blindness and also um, emotional uh, phenomenology. Next slide. Um, and Sean Alquist presented on his sensory spaces uh, and other projects dealing with um, interaction and textiles um, in space and tactility. Uh, and the last was a video sent in by um, John, Jonathan Duckworth, where he works with uh, people with mobility issues um, and using multimedia to help them uh, regain uh, mobility. Uh, and here's, I guess, the word cloud and us in discussion, which was really uh, quite uh, provocative. It, it was, I think, one of the, it was a great way to end the idea of inclusivity, uh, understanding that everyone is different and we have different perceptions, sensors, intellects, and needs. Um, in this last part, um, basically I'm revisiting the first graphic. What is it? Uh, to your left, in, I did a word cloud of kind of the basic statements of what we're looking at, design, change, existing roles, computation, on your right is uh, I took I made a word cloud of all the transcripts of all the lectures combined. Uh, very interesting that we had knowledge, think, work, way, people, design. Uh, briefly, what I'm working on right now is I'm working on the California 100 vision of strategy of the next century. So I'm a part of a group uh, with the Allosphere Research Group with Dr. Pacher Marin and my uh, um, colleague uh, Jean Johnstone from UC Berkeley. Goldman School of Public Policy, and I was tasked to look at the, the future of California, arts, culture, and entertainment. I'm including architecture there, and uh, I'm looking at uh, rewriting policy for 25, 50, 75, and 100 years into the future. And how does an architect or someone who's trained in architecture write for policy? I don't know, but I'll let you know. And that's it. So thank you. Thank you so much, Gustavo. Um, so as our audience might know, many of our panelists today do have to leave um, exactly on time at noon, but um, if everyone can uh, just turn their cameras on and, and some of our panelists have already had to leave, um, but I wanna thank all of you for participating um, and discussing today. There's so many overlaps. I know I've been uh, talking in the chat about um, these ideas of data and data collection 
Um, and also this overlap of AI, which was is really interesting. Um, how does AI play into this role of um, collecting, curating, organizing data as well and, and creating new data? Um, but I just want, would like each of you maybe to say a brief concluding statement as we wrap up. Um, so thank you so much. I don't know if we just wanna go kind of backwards in order um, and Tom or uh, Manos, maybe you wanna say something, um, just your thoughts on today uh, and thank yous. This is really a, a, a fantastic event. Thank you for organizing it. It's great to see some of the other workshops, you know, with 103 other workshops and the ones that we offered. Uh, of course, there was no opportunity to see what was going on. We're all distributed, atomized around the world. And I think that the, the Digital Futures organization of this Inclusive Futures workshops and talks and everything is, is so um, incredibly valuable, especially at this time. And, and the, the impact of these workshops and events, it, um, it's hard to measure that yet. Um, but it seems like the speed and acceleration of uh, the dissemination and sharing of architectural culture um, uh, skills, which is very much the kind of workshop mode of, of learning, uh, is, uh, is, is accelerated at this time, uh, which is a kind of interesting paradox of um, us being uh, so cut off internationally uh, and so localized. And I, I guess I have a question, just a, a rhetorical question about uh, the persistence of locality. Uh, that's certainly in, in many of these uh, workshops, there's, there's issues sources, databases that are very much specific and localized. Uh, and also what's able, what, what this, this whole agenda of these workshops have been able to achieve is to uh, enable people from all sorts of locales um, of means that maybe no, normally would not have access uh, to this sorts of bodies of knowledge. And I think that's also really uh, quite an unprecedented um, uh, uh, opportunity for so many people worldwide. Hey, pa Pablo, do you have something to say? Yeah, I mean, I just was thinking in terms of what uh, Tom uh, was saying, and thank you for the organization, because I think that the scale of, of, your, um, of your organization really surpassed expectations. And I think that that's very interesting in relationship to what Tom, you're saying about the relation between global and local, because uh, to me, there is a double fold. On the one hand, I'm trying to, to work even with archaeologists to try to see, um, you know, kind of lost civilizations and lost. To me, one of the uh, objectives is to actually critique from the system of representation and develop new systems of representation and new systems of automation, but also looking at how do we uh, access that information and uh, I'm particularly interested in, in the sense of politics and economy, right? Like what were the different relationships between humanity and uh, the environment that I think are lost and is crazy because capitalism is, is, you know, we are all kind of immersed in a system that is untouchable, right? And the world is collapsing and it's collapsing at many levels. It's not only collapsing at an environmental level, it's also collapsing at the cultural level. So the question of uh, lost civilization, lost cultures that were totally homogenized by uh, not only colonialism, imperialism, but also capitalism uh, is, is quite amazing because and I'm, I'm amazed how the, the media is not really touching capitalism as a problem, right? And then when you realize how other civilizations were engaging with environment in a very sophisticated way, and the way that we are dealing with environment, I think that we have to learn still a lot about uh, inclusive past, right? Like to, to see how we propel forward. But one of the things that I was thinking about is for instance, the, the problem between the local search in Google or the social validation bubbles that are local. Uh, I am now for the first time living in suburbia in the United States. When I do a search in Google, I am shocked by the uh, retrieval of the information that is geolocated. So we also have to be careful about the localized uh, cultural biases because in some places it's like you, you know, I mean, the things that I'm reading online is like crazy, right? Like lunatic people, right? Uh, so I think that the relation between global and uh, global culture and local culture has to be problematized. 
And we also have to be careful not to uh, submerge into localized thinking because that's also not interesting and it's actually wrong, right? So there is a, to me, there's a lot of things to resolve, uh, both in terms of politics, economy, uh, in relationship between the local and the global. Uh, political boundaries to me are, you know, something has to happen at that level because the biomes that we are sharing globally need to be problematized, not only from an economic point of view, but from a political boundary point of view. And I think that there's so many things that we can do as architects and urbanists, uh, both in terms of retrieving local data, but also addressing global commons and global concerns and understand the relationship and problematic problematizing that relationship to see how we can move forward uh, in a more consistent way. But thank you for the organization. And uh, I think it has been a terrific set of workshops and discussion. Yeah, and I also want to mention Tom and Pablo will be hosting another session um, in two weeks time, I believe, on AI and ethics. So please, our audience should tune in again um, in two weeks time to watch that session. It'll be totally different uh, work um, and different panel, but uh, thank you so much for being here today. Um, and I know you have to go, so bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much to everybody for the organization. Bye. Thank you, Pablo. And um, on the so topic also, of local and global, yeah, Manos, do you have something to say? Yeah, I just, first of all, I wanted to thank you all on behalf of Daniel and Charmaine as well for, for the yeah. opportunity to be here today. And uh, of course, I, I completely agree with both um, Tom and Pablo with regards to the kind of power that this kind of, um, you know, gatherings, you know, give us, and especially relative to Pablo's comment about this kind of localized, geolocated kind of information, you know, if, if we all are kind of, let's say, uh, victims of that to a certain degree, but, you know, each one of us within their own uh, localized sphere. So in, in, in that respect, I think it's kind of good that we, we're all here to be able to, to share something beyond that. And I think relative to your um, something you wrote earlier on the on the chat, Virginia, I, I completely agree with the fact that it was interesting to, on, on, on the first hand, I thought that there was a lot of diversity in the presentations. On the other hand, eventually I saw also a parallel between, for example, Pablo's and Nidhi's presentation with respect to, for example, looking at data gathering and curating versus to, for example, something, some other kind of um, maybe stage within the overall workflow, which perhaps relates to the workshop that uh, Daniel uh, and Shermin and I did, and, and I thought that there, it's interesting to see them all as kind of um, not overlaps, but continuities. For, for example, something along the lines of what Pablo or Nidhi were working on could have been a precursor to a workshop of the kind that, that we did, because in our case, even though you know we had, let's say, the longest kind of workshop within seven days, there's still this kind of lack of ability to not necessarily curate, but rather assess the data that, that you're actually choosing to, to, to use. You know, yeah. you know, you have to use certain kind of data. You don't have a choice if you want to get some kind of output, but then, you know, in, in hindsight, you know, there's so many more things you can do. And so I was thinking that with regards also to the notion of archiving and, um, and data bias, how important it is to, because uh, I think Nidhi asked, what, is the, um, what are the archives of the future? And, and kind of made me think back several years ago uh, when a friend of mine was studying library science and uh, a lot of us uh, tended to think how uninteresting or tedious, you know, you know, being in this kind of particular domain is at least compared to design. But I think more than any time, any other time today, you know, we begin to appreciate the value of the library and the value of the, you know, what, what now is emerging as different disciplines, like not data science goes much beyond that. But I think it's kind of interesting to see how, uh, you know, within architecture, within designs, uh, as designers and as, as researchers, we, we would need to find ways to, um, let's say, curate data or have other uh, people in, in a very direct way, though, you know, interact with us in terms of uh, not having to do the curation or the gathering ourselves, but having to, uh, being able to kind of select, you know, the, the right kind of data for any kind of uh, experiment. And I think in that respect, the tools that are developed vis-a-vis -vis the AI context um, allow us, for example, the visualization of latent space. Maybe it's an interesting um, opportunity for us to start thinking of both the archive data, but also our memories and other kind of information on more than 
uh, one dimension or more or more than the dimension that we typically use to understanding because the visualization of the latent space is, is, is meant to take multi-dimensional data you know and actually simplify it so uh, as humans were able to uh, decode some of its importance and so i think if we look forward to you know the prospects that ai is offering we can look back to this kind of information this kind of archival information that we've been used to process in a certain way maybe try to see how we could reinterpret the way we think about it as, as humans. I know this is a very big and, and complex subject that just, you know, it kind of, um, I, I couldn't stop thinking as, as everybody was, uh, was, was presenting. Do you want to yeah, go ahead, Nettie? <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, Nettie, do you have anything to say on that? Oh, and thank you. Thank you, Manos. That was very good, a very good way to think about this. Um, I think it's um, it's nice. It's interesting to see how um, how the knowledge is essentially my. We hear you. Oh, okay. Um, how knowledge moves across the board. I think um, for us, it was when we were having the discussions. It was good to know that. I think her computer. Can you yeah. repeat that again, Nettie? Um, my computer is hanging, but um, I think rethinking the architect in terms of the architect as either a data scientist or um, someone who relates to data, if you think about it in terms of the future of AI and tools like machine learning. And because um, right now architects, maybe we use um, tools like this. Am I still? Yes, you're, you're still going. Uh-oh. Sa Sadia, can you, uh, can you? <laughs> yeah, maybe you can chime in. <laughs> maybe you can chime in here. Uh, hello? Yep. Yes. Uh, uh, okay, this is Sadia. Uh, I, I was near this, near this partner. So, yeah. So, well, I, I mean, I think near what she was trying to say that as an architecture and uh, the data we use, uh, we actually, as an architect, when we, we, when we use a data in architecture a simulation or in any kind of simulation or in a BIM section or in urban design, I think uh, as the knowledge passing down, I think we have to look back as, uh, as Mano state that how the data has been collected and uh, the data, how it was divided into, uh, like, if there is, uh, what was the archival gaze of collecting those data? And if there was proper inclusivity when we were collecting that data? I think that she was trying to say, but if she wants to say more, please, Nedi, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just saying, um, the architect or the designer has, is, is stepping into new shoes, I think. Uh, everyone has to rethink their space within the this new revolution of technology. And if we're interacting with AI and uh, tools like machine learning, we have to think about how we as architects not necessarily produce new forms of data, but how, um, because we can't confine ourselves to physical spaces only. I mean, we're thinking about archives in terms of a digital twin and how we could exit, exist in spaces that are purely digital. How do we think about um, these new uh, manifestations of, of space? And also thinking because we were very uh, we're very keen on memory. I think memory is 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 important in how people interact with have interacted with space and how we interact with space. So we are thinking about spaces of the future. Can we input our memory and users' memory into how we create new spaces? Because I mean we have. Um, tools that are creating different architectural spaces and machines that machine learning creating different architectures. Can we input um, new forms of data and rethink it? Um, yeah, so that is just what, and also how we can influence archives of the future. Great. Well, I think we do need to wrap up because everyone needs to leave. But I think Gustavo um, asked one question. If, if you have any further reading or further resources for people who want to learn more about these topics, 
um, please share them with us. Uh, and, you know, I think we're just all here to learn. I think you saw from the workshop that Gustavo presented and I presented a little bit as well, is that we're just here to learn and we're being open-minded. And I think that um, all of these opportunities are just um, really interesting and um, through the workshops, trying to be inclusive and trying to be um, open-minded is really important. So and I wanna Vir thank you all again. Virginia, can I say one quick thing? Yes, I just wanted to say that we, I appreciate every, uh, Manos, Pablo, everyone who presented today. Nettie, I learned so much from you. I encourage you to be bold and just continue doing your work. I'm very interested in the idea of how architects can change the world for the better. I don't think we should be relegated to offices and to schools. I think we should be activists and leaders in politics. I'm looking at writing new policy for California. Uh, I've trained as an architect and that po policy will get to the government and then to the Biden administration. So how do we get more closer to power so that we can help each other. And I just approached with my colleagues, the idea of inclusivity very humbly because I don't assume to know anything from anyone. And I just want to be here for, for all of my community. So thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon, morning, yeah. evening, wherever you are. Thank you so much. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.